Well, hello, everybody. Happy today. Hope you're doing well. Uh, what an odd way to uh, wrap up uh, this unit, but to stop and sort of try and take stock of the big changes uh, that have occurred uh, to life on Earth. But here we go. Uh, it, in the end, it's sort of like chapter 25, 26, looking at sort of big moments in the history of life on Earth. So just to sort of set context to, to everything, uh, the universe began uh, approximately 15 billion years ago. You know, you got the Big Bang, all this energy uh, radiates out. Um, we start to have matter collect, and then uh, the universe begins to form. Now, about four and a half billion years ago, uh, Earth was created. And then about three and a half billion years ago, uh, life began on Earth. So uh, in the total history of the universe, uh, life on Earth is, you know, somewhat young. Now, what was life like uh, on early Earth? Well, uh, not very hospitable to life as we imagine it today. Um, at the beginnings of life on Earth, uh, the atmosphere was substantially different than it was, uh, was now. Um, there was no free oxygen in the atmosphere and lots of other compounds that would have made it toxic to uh, life on Earth. Uh, additionally, um, it was this uh, planet where you had, you know, these land masses that were being formed and you had all these, you know, the volcanic eruptions. And so it was sort of a rough, violent place. Uh, now, um, about three and a half billion years ago, again, life was created. Let's try to find a place to put my head here. Uh, life was created. Um, exactly how it began, uh, there's no, you know, exact uh recording of uh, events uh, for uh, the creation of life on Earth. Uh, so we have to sort of work our way back through how this possibly could have uh, uh, been set up. So the first thing that happens is the creation of big molecules or biological molecules. Think of um, like uh, the macromolecules, carbs, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. So uh, the basic idea is that you can use energy to break and form bonds and you can rearrange matter. Uh, through sort of very simple processes, you can simulate uh, the creation of some of these building blocks of life. Uh, in the Miller-Urey experiment, this is one you definitely need to know, uh, they were able to take gases they thought were present in Earth's early atmosphere, um, you know, nitrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and then they exposed it to uh, sparks from electrodes. Uh, the idea was uh, the sparks from the electrodes would try to simulate an energy in the environment and it would break and form chemical bonds. And then what they did was they collected molecules that were created uh, from those chemical reactions. And from that, they were able to extract some uh, amino, uh, amino acids, uh, uric acid, stuff like that. So they were able to build some of the monomers that we associate with life. So did they create life? Well, no. But what they demonstrated in this experiment is that uh, you can sort of use materials and energy present on Earth to create uh, some of these building blocks of life. Uh, now, eventually, monomers can join together and form polymers, larger, more complex molecules. And remember, one of the first ideas we learned of the year, emergent properties. When you build more complex systems, they take on new properties and can do new systems or do new things. Um, Another idea for how we could have gotten molecules on Earth was seeding from uh, like meteorites. Uh, the idea was that um, stuff that has struck the Earth and helped form the Earth contains some of the molecules that were able to sort of uh, get life going. All right, now, uh, so the first thing was creation of these molecules. Uh, and again, as you get more complex molecules, they have the potential to do different things. Uh, the other thing we need to do is um, encapsulate it, right? So the second important component for the creation of life is the creation of these protocells or these primitive cells. And it's basically uh, a membrane. You know, you can take phospholipids and they can create a bilayer. And what would be possible is to create these sort of uh, envelopes that separate, you know, at least partially the internal environment from the external environment. And you can do this in lab uh, fairly simply. You can create these sort of membranous sacs 
And within that, you can also then have sort of a, a primitive metabolism. So the idea was you have this accumulation of molecules, then you have the creation of these little membrane bound sacs. And if you have molecules within those sacs, then that can lead to the development of uh, sort of very primitive metabolic reactions. Uh, next thing we need is some control over this, right? So you need an information molecule to store instructions on what can be created and when to create it. So to sort of put some control on this, uh, we needed a molecule that provided or could direct activities of other molecules. And that has led to what's referred to as the RNA world or the RNA hypothesis. The idea is that RNA was the first molecule of heredity, not DNA. Uh, and that's because RNA has some enzymatic activities or capabilities. If you recall from earlier in the semester, we talked about ribozymes. Uh, those are pieces of RNA, but because they're single-stranded and have some exposed bases, it can actually catalyze some reactions. So RNAs, not only can they store information in their bases, they can also sort of influence chemical activities or, or in uh, increase the rate of chemical reactions. So the first molecule of heredity was probably RNA because, again, it could direct things uh, and actually stimulate some of the chemical reactions. Now, of course, RNA being single-stranded is not a super stable molecule. So DNA evolved later on as a more stable uh, molecule of heredity. All right. And step four, you got to repeat, right? Uh, so if these cells can create these molecules and then the membranes divide, then you can have multiple cells. And over time, complexity can increase. And what it's led to is this positive feedback loop of ever increasing complexity to where we get all this incredible diversity of life. And of course, if you have literally billions of years, then it gives time for this kind of stuff to occur. All right, so now we'll look at some of the big moments in the history of life on Earth. Uh, one big thing is photosynthesis, the advent of photosynthesis. Now, recall early on there was no molecular oxygen in the air, uh, but about three billion years ago, uh, some of the first forms of life, like cyanobacteria, like we see here, uh, radically changed the atmosphere of life on Earth and made it possible for all sorts of other organisms to uh, come into being. So what cyanobacteria were able to do was take the ample carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere, remove some of that carbon dioxide, and turn it into tissue, okay? turn it into uh, biomass. And one of the byproducts of photosynthesis that we know is oxygen. So oxygen is released in the atmosphere. And then oxygen, um, again, its presence allowed for other evolutionary changes that makes life more complex. Uh, so here we see some fossil evidence of the remains of these bacterial populations from billions of years ago. So that's what life was like in the beginning of uh, life on Earth. Uh, so again, this radical uh, change in the atmosphere on Earth made all sorts of opportunities possible for other organisms because we were able to evolve uh, aerobic respiration. With aerobic respiration, think of what we learned about like with mitochondria, uh, with aerobic respiration, you can extract a lot more energy out of biomolecules and produce a tremendous amount of ATP. So if more energy is available, you can do more things, right? And again, that can promote uh, increasing complexity in organisms. Uh, another big moment in uh, life on Earth uh, was the evolution of eukaryotic cells. Uh, eukaryotic cells have a true nucleus. And we know that with a nucleus, you can make all sorts of changes to the DNA and the messenger RNA. So we now have, rather than one circular chromosome, many linear chromosomes uh, with additional instructions for creation of additional proteins. We can modify those instructions uh, in the mRNA and uh, make all sorts of different protein products. You have membrane-bound organelles. Think of like the rough ER, smooth ER, mitochondria, stuff like that. And what that does is it allows for increased efficiency in certain chemical reactions. By concentrating enzymes with, within certain organelles, you can now make uh, different reactions uh, more efficient. So we're basically increasing the efficiency of cells. Uh, you also have the endomembrane system. 
That's like your rough ER, the Golgi, all that stuff where you can modify these proteins to do very specific jobs. Uh, of course, one question that also often gets asked is about endosymbiosis. Uh, the endosymbiotic hypothesis was developed by Lynn Margulis. And the idea is that uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts that we see today in uh, eukaryotic cells evolved from uh, prokaryotic cells that invaded a, a primitive cell. And rather than you know, destroying one another, uh, they formed a mutually uh, symbiotic uh, or mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship. Uh, so what we see with mitochondria and chloroplasts is they have their own DNA that sort of resembles bacterial DNA. They have their own ribosomes that are more similar to bacterial ribosomes. They're double membrane, which sort of shows them being swallowed up. And they sort of operate semi-independently. They divide on their own schedule and stuff like that. So uh, again, what this all leads to is greater efficiency and the capacity to sort of do more work. Uh, let's see. Another huge moment for life on Earth was the uh, creation of multicellular organisms. So here is sort of an example of uh, sort of primitive multicellularity. It's Volvox, the type of uh, alga. Uh, and what algae uh, like Volvox can do is you have like 40 or 50,000 individual cells embedded in a gel mass. So that's why it looks sort of clear there. And what these cells can do is communicate with one another and interact with one another. So this is all based on sort of, again, primitive cell signaling, like the quorum sensing that we've seen in bacteria. If cells can send and receive signals, then they can coordinate their activities. And here in Volvox, you have different types of cells will do different things. Some will be sort of like, quote, somatic cells. Some will be reproductive cells. And these cells can sort of coordinate their activities. So multicellularity allows for increasingly large and increasingly complex organisms. But again, they're using chemical signaling that's based on primitive stuff that bacteria do. So over time, we've seen this pattern of ever increasing uh, biodiversity. Because if you can imagine, as um, species and uh, other sort of taxonomic groups become more complex, they can continue to radiate out and adapt in different ways. And so that has led to, again, sort of an ever increasing amount of biodiversity uh, in life on earth with some you know, notable moments. And that's what we'll talk about here, extinction events. Um, earth is old and always changing, right? And there have been times in earth's history where significant changes in the earth have led to mass extinctions. More than 99% of all species that have ever existed have gone extinct. And extinction rates have spiked five times in the history of life on Earth. So here uh, you can see in red, there's one, two, three, four, five. The most recent of which was uh, when the, the dinosaurs were killed off uh, like 65 million years ago. Uh, and the startling thing is we are now entering uh, a sixth uh, extinction event. Uh, so with climate change, with habitat fragmentation and um, habitat loss due to human activity, uh, we've now entered this period of rapid extinction events and um, you know we're, we're living through another uh, mass extinction. Uh, so one thing that happens following these periods of mass extinction is if you have a lot of organisms die off, what that does is it creates niche space. It creates opportunity for other organisms to or other populations to evolve and fill that niche space, take those resources and use them. And so what that leads to is what's called adaptive radiation. So with adaptive radiation, when there's been a die off and there's been sort of resources open up, then you see big explosions in diversity and that allows sort of new forms of life to come into being and use those resources. Uh, a good example of this is what happened to mammals following the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. Prior to the extinction of the dinosaurs, this is what mammals were basically like down the bottom left. They're these tiny little shrew-like things uh, that were nocturnal and tree-dwelling. And um, they basically they were like the size of a paperclip. So before 
uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs, there were only certain types of mammals. Mammals were not very diverse, and they only occupied a very small amount of niche space. But after the dinosaurs died off, then there was this huge, again, it's called an adaptive radiation. You get all these different types of mammals came into being, uh, which include you know, our ancestors. So, um, again, big uh, changes here. Uh, another example of rapid uh, evolution, you know, again, relatively rapid, this is over tens of millions of years, uh, was what's referred to as the Cambrian explosion. So with the Cambrian explosion, we have all sorts of different forms of uh, animal life, you know, large multicellular animal life come into being. So extinction kills off a lot of organisms. I think like with uh, the dinosaurs, it's like 75% of species on Earth went extinct. So, ooh, big opportunity for adaptive radiation there, and the mammals sort of took advantage of that. Uh, and um, again, with the Cambrian explosion, we've got uh, the different um, phyla or groups of animals that we see. All right, uh, let's see. Other stuff we see in evolution, uh, it's sort of the time of humans here. Uh, you know, humans have been around for like 250,000 years. Modern humans have been around for 250,000 years. But with the advent of modern agriculture, um, rather than being like nomadic groups, people have sort of settled, had increases in technology, uh, and have had tremendous impact on life on Earth and on biodiversity. So human activity, of course, is driving change that we see in climate. And uh, again, with the conversion of um, wild lands to managed lands that uh, people use, uh, we've seen a lot of species extinction. So you can sort of track over the last couple thousand years, or this is not even that long, last 500 years, um, changes in the human population and changes in uh, species uh, diversity or again, I guess, number of extinctions. Now, part of this will certainly be technology, uh, technological advancements in people's ability to sort of record uh, extinction events. But we do know that extinction is accelerating as a result of uh, some of the changes caused by humans. Uh, let's see. Now, how does evolution occur? Well, there's microevolution and then there's macroevolution, right? Um, you can have small changes that occur. Um, population, then you can have radical changes. How do you get major reorganization of organisms? Well, one thing to make note of is the fact that not all genes have equivalent influence. Some genes um, have an outsized influence on how organisms develop. Some genes are referred to as like patterning genes that sort of lay out the organization of the body. And one such category of like really important genes are called Hox genes. Hox genes are involved in sort of the basic structure or layout of the body. Um, there's segmentation that occurs in our bodies. Think about like your vertebrae that occur in your spine or like the segmentation of like abdominal muscles um, or the arrangement of the uh, extremities um, in your, like your arms and legs. So your, our body is highly segmented. And if you change these Hox genes, you can actually change the layout of bodies of uh, organisms. So uh, you can compare the vertebrae of snakes, and here we're looking at chickens, uh, and what you can do is by altering these Hox genes, you can basically change the number of segments that are present uh, in organisms. So again, uh, mutations uh, create variation, and if you create survivable mutations in Hox genes, that could lead to major reorganization of the body. All right, that brings us to the end of uh, looking at uh, evolution and the diversity of life on Earth.